Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 439th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between John Sims and Karen Finley on the occasion of John Sims's residency workshop, 2020 Divisions of America at La Mama from December 2nd through the 5th of this year. We're also thrilled to have the poet Bob Holman here who will read to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. Here at The Rail, we are celebrating our 21st anniversary by working on our first ever endowment campaign. This initiative will ensure that the print edition of The Rail and our public programming celebrating cross-pollination in the arts, humanities, and sciences all remains free and accessible for generations to come. Please check the chat for more information and links. The Rail also acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll be posting in just a moment. But now to introduce today's guest and host, Detroit native and Sarasota-based multimedia artist, writer, and activist, John Sims, creates art and curatorial projects spanning the areas of installation, performance, text, music, film, and large-scale activism, informed by mathematics, design, the politics of white supremacy, sacred symbols slash anniversaries, and poetic slash political text. His performance work has been featured across the country, including the Virginia Museum of Arts, Ringling Museum of Art, Houston Museum of African American Culture, and the Detroit Institute of Arts. For the last 20 years, John Sims has been working on the National Art Activism Project Recoloration Proclamation, which explores, re-examines, and remixes Confederate iconography as it relates to the African American African American experience. And our host today, born in Chicago, Karen Finley, received her MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute, working in a variety of mediums such as installation, video, performance, public art, visual art, entertainment television and film, memorials, music, and literature. She has presented her work worldwide. She is the author of eight books and a recipient of many awards and grants, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and many others. In 2015, she was awarded the Richard J. Massey Foundation Arts and Humanities Award. Without further ado, Karen, over to you. John, it's so good to see you. I... <laughs> I'm just so glad to be here with you at La Mama. And thank you, everyone with Brooklyn Rail. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. And I just have to tell everyone, John is one of my favorite artists and people. And I'm just so thrilled about your residency. And you're going to be showing films. And you're going to be having uh, readings and you're going to be doing listening programs so it's going to be a wonder so i really uh suggest strongly for you to get your ticket to come to this residency for this rare opportunity and i want to so john i'd like to just sort of start a little bit about um starting with your background and it, in the introduction here it was saying that you're a detroit uh native and one of my favorite videos of your of your work is is the video that you did on Aretha and the hurricane. And so I was wondering if we could start with yes. that. Do you want to maybe begin a little yes, bit? And tell yes, yes. Well, you know, um, in Motown, Detroit, uh, home of the Queen of Soul. And uh, when she passed, uh, I helped organize her exhibition, tribute exhibition, as well as part of that tribute exhibition was to do this video called Hurricane uh, Aretha. And certainly she has a hurricane kind of gigantic whirlwind kind of presence and I wanted to honor that uh, with this work. So let's check it out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In the beginning of all beginnings, there was a whisper and a big bang, big bang, 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 a cosmic collision and an atomic hurricane delivering starlights of swirling radiation of electronic elements for the gift yes, of, gravity, of gravity, for the, for gift, the gift of matter, matter, for the gift of life, in the name of all things supernatural. In this hurricane, there was an eye, a womb of incubation, 
a place of transformation for the birth of earth, for the birth of humanity, for the birth of soul. Shout out to Sylvia Balak who helped me, uh, who did the uh, vocals on that with me. Uh, she did a great job. Yeah. With that. I, just, I just love that that video so so much, and just and also in your your background of being from Detroit and all the elements that you're speaking about. And I know that we have a short time here, right. an hour, so I'm going to move on. Right. I just wanted to sort of sort of have a, a place in space first and i appreciate that and i know that in, but not our audience doesn't is that your background is that you, you call yourself that you are a math artist right and that you're actually uh working in in math right. and it's a phd uh candidate in math so that you're you're a mathematician right and so do you want to speak about that a little bit and then we can see some images and how math then brought you to the work that you're doing with the computer Well, yeah, so yeah, yeah, some interest in the math, the art, film, text, which have informed um, some major projects. Well, the very first one was time sculpture. Um, and, and then that moved into my math artwork. And then out of that came this piece that we worked on, Square Root of Love. And then in that is also this bigger project uh, of, of the recoloration proclamation. Um, but I think in terms of math and art, I think really what I'm really interested in is structure, design, and how things are connected. And I think my introduction to art came through looking at everyday design objects and subverting them 
and, uh, and sort of uh, responding to objects that either I felt uh, uh, sort of happy about or confronted about. And so my very first project was time sculpture. And, and that started with me designing clocks. I'm very interested in clocks and time and in the context of dynamic, Numbers. <laughs> di kind of dynamical systems and that type of thing, which led me to uh, uh, work on this piece called Time Sculpture, uh, this fantasy of turning New York City into a clock. But let's get to the next slide. You'll see um, one of the feature elements of that work in the next slide. Uh, yeah, so this is the poster. In, this is these objects that I want to describe. Mm -hmm. So chess sets, vases, clocks, mm -hmm. and thinking of vases as a function, like, mm -hmm. you know, this idea of a cradle of space, mm -hmm. a function of space. What do we do with the space? We move things around, we get time, and that kind of thing. And so in the next slide, we'll see uh, um, this, this is where I begin to think about issues around supremacy and power and class. And so looking at a chess set, I was always perturbed why white pieces move first. Mm -hmm. Like, why is that? And so I created this chess set here called Chess Set for uh, Structural Imbalance. And as you see, the black pieces are on the bottom, they kind of sublimate into the background. And as you go up, the pieces, the aluminum pieces on top, begin to move, kind of fall into the structure of the board mm -hmm. in terms of how it looks in terms of its own structure. So actually the king is connected to the board, is mm -hmm. part of the board. So there's an intrinsic sort of privilege and uh, sort of advantage when you are part of the board, board of trustees, board of mm -hmm. and you help shape the language and the rules and the regulations of the playing field. And so the ones on the bottom, they're attracted to this idea of mountaintop. But the mountain is not your mountain, right? The mountain is created to your disadvantage and sometimes to the entertainment of the folks who created the mountain or the game mm -hmm. or whatever. And so this, this kind of spoke to that. And I, I think the next slide up is there. Um, well, in terms of dealing with the, the, the structure imbalance, uh, I created another chess set where the pieces are all the same, same mm -hmm. colors. It's called chess set for the color block. Um, and then that got me thinking about structure and symmetry and more mathematical kind of things, leading to um, a kind of conceptual piece, uh, which is the math art philosophy here. We go back to the previous slide where you see um, I'm looking at taking a fractal tree and a drawn tree and creating this root tree root metaphor. How does mathematics and structure uh, informs art? Mm -hmm. And then how does art inform mathematics with the true root of a fractal? And then how we have this balance, which is you've seen in the math art brain, mm -hmm. being able to find a balance between the structure of things and the soul and expression mm -hmm. of things and how that synergetic kind of strategies or strike can sort of create something magical and interesting. So this is kind of a synthetic mm -hmm. nervous system that guides my conceptual work. You, you also, just in these few examples we're seeing, is that nature using the symbols or metaphors of nature as a way to be bringing out other concepts as a strategy? Is that right, right. absolutely. So I'm looking at nature, the geometry of nature, um, the design of nature, thinking about evolution, how things evolve, you try out all these different permutations and combinations and possibilities and how certain things survive and how certain things don't survive. Um, and so I kind of mimic that in terms of my design strategies mm -hmm. and ideas, you know, like living in a landscape of growing ideas that compete for each other, cannibalize each other, mm -hmm. and sometimes grow into bigger structures. And so, uh, I think my, and I also look at my work as a body of work, mm -hmm. not just orphan things, but a body that has its own ecosystem and um, survive off of its own internal physics. And so that I'm thinking that's how I move the projects in terms of this bigger uh, system. They're holistic and environmental right, too. Right, exa so exactly. That 
philosophy that you've been working with or has been part of your project making for you know, 20 years. Right. Would it be all right if we would move to the quilts? To yeah, look yeah. At so, that in collaboration? yeah. So, so here you, so this is one of the projects, I think the, 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 the if you hit the next slide, yeah, yeah, so or even, like yeah, yeah, that one. The, the math art stuff got me thinking about curating shows mm -hmm. and thinking as a curator, which is almost mm -hmm. like a gardener, right? Mm -hmm. I'm gardening and pulling things together mm -hmm. to seeing bigger structure that's beyond my own vocabulary and learning from that so we can create sort of a landscape of just nice things. So here, you know, I get I, I curated a show, math art show with all the big heavyweights of like Saul Witt, Frank Stella, Dorothea Rockburn, Howard Dean, all these various folks who, who, who use math in their work. Because, you know, when I was teaching at Ringling uh, School of Art and Design, I was very interested in how to um, inspire art students to connect mathematical thinking into their creative process. And then also here, looking at this African American art. You know, International Review of African American Art, I guess, edited that to do a whole um, issue on looking at math art in the African diaspora. And so this is my curatorial writing work, which has been a very big part of my process. Mm -hmm. And next slide, please. But, you know, as an artist, I wanted to, you know, do my own thing, right? So in terms of just being a curator and an educator, and so thinking about how, uh, what should I do? So I was very interested and this notion of seeing pi, you know, pi's looking at the diameter dividing to the circumference of a circle. It's one of these numbers that never repeat. It's irrational. It has all these incredible properties, but it's so connected to something so simple like a circle, which is so universal, both on a, in terms of physics and planetary motion and just the way things move and, and the way you can just identify it in this pure perfection. And so the circle pi and visualizing that. So I thought, hey, wouldn't it be nice to visualize pi? So I started uh, doing some investigations around that. You'll see in this next slide called seeing pi as a digital image. And so this is me thinking about seeing pi. And, all that. and I wanted to make a real mm -hmm. and, and start thinking of this as quilts, as a quilt. Mm -hmm. So I've reached out to uh, the Amish quilting shop in Sarasota, Florida, see if they would, you know, make a a kind of a version of this. And to my astonishment, the owner of the uh, quilt shop, who's Mennonite, uh, who grew up in this community, part of her family, had a, a real strong science background. And so we were able to connect across the, her fascination with both art and mathematics and social justice. Uh, we ended up doing, ended up helping me do 13 math art books, eight feet by eight feet. And, and were these collaborations yeah. then? Well, they, well they, they, yeah, in terms of helping me, you know, bring these ideas and bring these concepts of visualizing, but in terms of construction, uh, she got me, uh, taught me how to quilt, uh, got, got me a sewing machine, you know, cutting uh, top layers and quilting tops. And, uh, yeah, so I'm... She taught me how to quilt, so I appreciate that. Um, right. and, and in fact, did we, uh, you know that show Breaking Amish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they came to Sarasota and filmed uh, uh, a, a part there, her shop, and, and, and I was filmed in that, and that was cut from the show, but. Uh. <laughs> anyway, next slide. Like, so here you'll see, uh, these are the 13 mm -hmm. quilts that, based on pie, Pythagorean, mm -hmm. uh, self-portrait, here you see it as a system, right? I'm thinking in terms of system, these, these quilts work as a system, almost like mm -hmm. its own atom in a way. And then the middle are these uh, quilting, uh, these, these um, kind of uh, swatches of fabric that I got from Ghana, that I got in the oh, mid nineties. And I, and I held on them for so long. And then I finally found a place to put them in the mm -hmm. center of this project. And, and, and you'll see that, you know, this, this idea of patterns and structure is such a big part of human mm -hmm. neurology and mindset of ordering disorder, symmetry, dissymmetry, and these type of things. So, so this speaks to uh, to that uh, going from self-portrait, you know, Africa, you know, West African design, Pythagorean pie. Yeah. So this is uh, 
this is kind of my math art stuff and, and I'm gonna continue to work with this projects going forward and be able to travel this work mm -hmm. and, and get people excited about the connection of mathematics and art, which is also part of my activism. And, and also with quilts and, and crafts and right. just the history of quilts and all the influences of, of quilts and just the warmth that they occupy and just the math. I just think it's a tremendous project. Yes, th thank you. And I, from here, I think that unless we have more that we want to yeah, see yeah, with yeah, this. Yeah. This is, yeah. Oh yeah, the square root love. So part of the quilting thing put in a big way is this idea of quilting numbers and patches to see five and quilting, um, quilts, right? That's what I did, quilting quilts, right? Mm -hmm. Now um, I have the opportunity, to, if you go back to the previous slide, I have the opportunity to go to the Bowery Poetry Club, Bob Holden, who's here with us today, gave me the opportunity to quilt a collection of shows. Oh. So <laughs> I had nine mathematical art shows over a year period and uh, and, and then we ended up having groups of poets respond to each of the shows and then we quilted that together as one mega show. So we had folks like uh, Paradox Solowit and Adrian Piper, you and I did a show together, um, DJ Spooky and Dred Scott. And, and we had all kinds of great folks a part of that. And I ended up teaching a course mm -hmm. with the theme of rhythm yes. and structure at, at NYU. You helped bring me over there. And, and, and some of those students picked up on the. So this was a very interesting, um, so you see the idea of building, you know, this quilting and clock making mm -hmm. and bringing that all together and with the show. The next slide, please. And part of that was the square root of love uh, in that show that we did together with the Bowery Portrait Club. We asked the question, what times what is love? And, um, and that Still was- Still trying very, to figure that yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> next slide. This is the, the piece that you and I did mm -hmm. at the Bowery. Remember mm -hmm. that you took- yeah, so um, I took music and placed it over, you know. It was, was Anna Skate, who was the, uh, uh, Andre Anna That's right, that's right. And so we did this show um, and ended up coming to Sarasota for the film festival and doing another show with that, which led into me creating a wine project called Square Root of Love. And so every Valentine's Day, mm -hmm. I now been, which is now part of my next group of projects is taking over holidays like Pi Day, mm -hmm. Square Root of Love, and then you'll see for Memorial Day, next slide. You know, this is the project we did with this wine project uh, out of France, south of France, and ended up uh, premiering that in Paris. Uh, next slide. Oh, and then, so I've been doing this every year on Valentine's Day. This past year, um, as an artist and resident at the Rosemary Time restaurant, I invited Republican and Democrats officials to come a part of this dinner party to read their favorite poems between courses. We should have that happening <laughs> more often or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, next slide, please. So this leads into the Confederate Park. Is this where you want to show? The... I think this would be, I think let's just, uh, let's explain it just for a moment yeah. here. Um, I think that, you know, looking at the quilts and all the work that you've been doing is now to the next uh, project, which is also part with what you're doing here at La Mama. The recoloration proclamation, which, which uh, its theme is kind of reclaiming the Confederate flag, right. and so going from the fabric or the fabrication, and, and then you, that's what you've been spending uh, right. really so, like about twenty years on. Right. So this idea is look look what happened with the math and art. Right. We took the math and art and collided them. So these almost oppositional things. And so it just made sense to take something like the Confederate flag and then mix that up with the red, black, and green mm -hmm. and black nationalism and collage those and see what happens. So I started, you know, seeing the Confederate flag when I came down to Florida and was like. Well, just it, back up for one minute because you're saying coming down. So from Detroit, that wouldn't have been an image that you would be seeing on cars and things like right. that. Right, so <laughs> growing up in Detroit, half my family's from Birmingham, Alabama, and and I did spend some time here in, in the South uh, very early with flags and 
the, those things were not part of my vocabulary. Coming to Detroit, it would be the rebels versus the Yankees, mm -hmm. but it wasn't politicized at that point. It was only later that you put it in the context of Confederate history and slavery and trauma and, and, and Jim Crow and segregation and that type of thing. And so, so coming down to, you know, to Florida to work um, and seeing all these Confederate flags everywhere, and also in the late 90s, there was this big issue in South Carolina where the Confederate flag was on the dome, the state capitol. And I remember seeing that on TV and being completely mesmerized and seeing the demonstrations there of many white Southerners protecting that space. And they had this huge red, white, blue Confederate flag on the steps of the, capital, uh, of the state house in South Carolina and Columbia. And I remember watching uh, the TV and thinking, what can an artist, what can I do to contribute to this discussion? And then that's when I took the bump, made a bumper sticker. Oh, you Black started with the bumper sticker. You started with the bumper sticker. And then from the bumper sticker, I did a real flag, took that to Soho DFN Gallery, right at the height of what was happening in South Carolina. And I remember filming having these big VHS cameras, you know, mm -hmm. filming people's responses as they walk by this black, red, and green Confederate flag. And well, let's, for our yeah. viewers here, let's, there, that's, the have, that's the first flag that yeah. you uh, made. But, but we want to back up. And okay. We want to back up and play that video. Over. Yes, I think that, let's, let's show the video yeah. that gives a feeling, and then we can maybe look at a few slides. Yeah. This is an important. So this is the trailer of the work over the years. Uh, of this film that I'll be showing here in the moment. Many scores ago, there was born an evil among us. Now we are engaged in a continued great war of memories, monuments, and terror. terror, 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 terror. Exhibit has a lot of features, but the main one is a lynching of the Confederate flag. You don't get any, you don't get any worse than this. No place more should these men be honored than a place where, in the next 48 hours or so, there will be an attempt at their desecration. The Confederate flag, as representative of the Confederate States of America and its Constitution, shall hang. Show, show, show. to a space of redemption and rebirth that honors and protects peace, peace liberty, 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 and justice, justice, justice for us all. Us, us, us. Thank you, John. I really look forward to seeing this film and you've spent 20 years Right. Working on reclaiming the flag, right. changing the colors, exhibitions, mm -hmm. uh, the proper way to hang the flag, right. the, the, the bearing the flag, like a lynching of the flag. So give us a little bit more uh, context or a little bit more right. about what, what happened. Your life so is. go back to the yeah. previous flag. If you so this, this flag came to, I brought it after doing the bumper sticker, bringing it to Soho. And what year are we looking at? We're looking at 2000, maybe. I think it was mm -hmm. 2000. So it wasn't really as much in the, the overall consciousness as it has been in recent years. Oh, no, right? no, no. This was, it was in the consciousness of responding to white protection of the Confederate flag in the American South. You see what I'm saying? Yes, so it wasn't yes. kind of this massive black response other than what was happening with the NAACP's mm -hmm. um, um, boycott of South Carolina. Here I recolored this flag and then um, I ended up taking it to Harlem, right? So the next slide shows. So I started recoloring different, you know, the next slide I'll show that. Recoloring white on white on white, black and white, um, also looking at other flags. And then I got invited, uh, this was 2002, but in 2004, I got invited to show work uh, in Gettysburg. 
Now here's the difference. This is the critical. When I was at this show, we had a uh, like a Florida colored configure, you know, orange, yellow, white, mm -hmm. like hanging outside the gallery. And this is young Jim. guy walked by and he was like, why is this Confederate flag in Harlem? And, like, and folks out said, well, colors are different. Like, we don't care about no damn colors. It's still mm -hmm. the Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. So here we see that the color changing was not enough to be able to overcome a certain level of trauma and pain mm -hmm. in, in terms of how this, this code was creating anxiety. So I realized that I, the work needed to be expanded to show my real politics, and real mm -hmm. feeling. So it was actually his, you would think when you, when you do an exhibition, you invite your friends and people in the art world, that there would be some critical, no. It took a guy walking down the street mm -hmm. to be like, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. to, push, to push the work forward, right? And did you feel that the recoloration uh, would neutralize the power of it or tell me yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I thought the, the the recoloring had a couple different effects. One, it had one of of taking over, of confiscating, like we're in your space. Mm -hmm. It also had this comedic element, where you know part of comedy or interesting parts of comedy is taking things you don't expect to be connected mm -hmm. and crashing. And you, it's a surprise, like whoa, you wouldn't expect those You're things to be connected. Yeah. So it's that element based on the different reactions I've gotten from, from, from that particular work. But it also, there was a space of confusion. And what I mean by that is, is some works by themselves can be confusing unless it's put in context with other work, right? And so if I do Black, Green, Green, Confederate, you're not sure if I'm pro-Confederate mm -hmm. and making a, a, a point of advocacy for Black rebels back in the day or for some sort of reconciliation with confederacy it's not clear wh wh where i'm coming in on that and so um the, this fellow who was in harlem it wasn't clear for him right but it, it created a certain level of anxiety and even anger that fed back to me to like i need to do more work all right so so with that i ended up creating a new piece when i got invited to uh, gettysburg called the proper way to hang a confederate flag can we see that can we think, let's go to the next yeah, and so that we yeah. should probably say the Gettysburg is is the famous uh, right. place where the battle, where the a worst major battle, where lots civil of war, like how many people, fifty thousand, you know, died. You know, um, Lincoln came and did the Getty, famous Gettysburg Address, mm -hmm. turning point in the Civil War. Um, so the idea was to do a proper way to hang the Confederate flag. It got recontextualized as a lynching, which wasn't my intent. So I oh, so that was language that was put on right. what you're doing. Isn't, isn't, I, I think that's so important to right. understand. I was trying to be a little slick and sly by saying the proper way to hang a mm -hmm. Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. The press releases wanted to sort of amplify and create, create this kind of like, these artists lynches Confederate flag, like black man lynch, you know, mm -hmm. playing on right. that. And my, my point was not to be inflammatory, but to create an invitation and then allow maximal different kinds of people to engage the work mm -hmm. from their space. And so the Sons of Confederate Veterans got really upset and launched a boycott of Gettysburg based on this work. Um, and so, next slide please. And then, so this is now recoloring not just one flag, but all the different Confederate flags. Mm -hmm. So there are now requires some research. And we're like, it wasn't just one, how many, many. How many? Five major Confederate flags. Oh. You got the you got the first national, second national, third national. The one that we look at is the naval flag and the square one was the battle flag. And so I've been very partial to the battle flag because it has that X growing up in the eighties, the Malcolm X, X, and that type of thing. So uh, I played with that. Next slide, please. And so this is the piece. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this piece. This was designed to be outdoors. Is this the one for Gettysburg yes. then? That it would be out? So it's like an outdoor, it was for the outdoor installation and sculpture. Right, absolutely, absolutely outdoors. And it, I invited Mary Baraka to come down to read the death warrant. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, we're gonna have it outdoors for three weeks, and then at the end, take the flag and bury it in the Black Union uh, uh, Soldier Cemetery. So, oh, the cemetery. so that so was the original important. performance. That never happened, and I ended up doing a smaller piece. Uh, and because I didn't really, I felt pressured to to cancel the show. I didn't refuse to cancel the show. I did as much as I could do within the that was available. But for context and future context, I boycotted my own show, mm -hmm. right? So let, let, no, look, this is what I can do, but I'm not happy that I wasn't allowed to do what we agreed to do in the beginning, that there was pressure from the Sons of Confederate Veterans on the citywide level, at the institutional level. And here we are off in Iraq, trying to topple Saddam Hussein on false pretenses about weapons of mass destruction. I just found that just so fundamentally um, problematic, more than problematic, mm -hmm. not a problematic. So the next slide, please. I, I, I want to ask a question here. Just, do you, I know that later you have been working on bearing the flag right. and for our viewers, right. we'll come to that in a minute, but I just want to know, have you ever then wanted to revisit Gettysburg? Like, now, would you try to do it again? Or do you have the words that Amira Baraka was going to? You know, right, right. Is there an archive yeah, of that? Yeah, that yeah, yeah. I, you know, I would love to go back to Gettysburg yeah. and do this right. There's an open invitation for Gettysburg to, to come back and hopefully win a different time and space of courage to be able to provide mm -hmm. space for creatives and artists to, to really begin the process of healing and recovery um, in a place like Gettysburg. Um, and, and also how you were treated. Right, right. You know, you're very, you know, disrespected and, and you weren't able to right. do your work and how you right. wanted to and how important that work yes. was. Yeah, so that began the, That's so I could have stopped here, but I continued. So next. That's uh, what we love yeah, about yeah. you. So here I come back to the Bowery Poetry Club. Uh, thank you, Bob, again. And here I, uh, you know, the poetry community has been very, very important, the text in writing, because this is where we, as a repository, this is where we deposit all of this work mm -hmm. and it becomes language, it becomes stories. So in history moving forward. And here um, we ended up uh, having all kinds of folks uh, respond uh, to the flag. I, I brought it back to the art wall. I, I invited you to be a part of that as well. Uh, next slide, please. And, and I this is know, the art wall. What were some of the, you know, what was some of the responses in that you, in the, in the image that you're using that related to this project? How, how were you as an artist, um, working with the images? What were some of the, where were you at with that? Well, I got, you no, know, I got responses that, a range of responses. Some were, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Stick to math art, like this is, and then other folks who were like, this is transformative mm -hmm. and this is important work. But at some point I began to be, continue to do the work for my own, You're, my own thing. Believe, yes. Yeah, for my own, like, I felt like I started the story I wanted to finish the story. And so coming back to La Mama is part of finishing the story, mm -hmm. considering that I really started it here in Soho with mm -hmm. this, uh, this flag uh, there on Prince and Broadway and to come back to La Mama with this you know, 20, over 20 years later is probably the, oh, is the beginning beautiful? of that end of that story. So at least my part of that. So next slide, that's the Bowery Portrait Club, by the way, what you're looking at. And then in 2007, I got invited to the Broken Museum. Remember that? Yes. Where that even got covered by the New York Times, where mm -hmm. the, the, the Sons of Confederate Veterans tried to shut the show down. This was a uh, group show uh, at, at the Brogan in Tallahassee downtown. And someone from the Sons of Confederate Veterans tried to shut the show down using a Florida statute that says that it's prohibitive to desecrate the Confederate flag. Mm -hmm because I was going to be hanging the flag in that show. And that statue is still on the books in Florida, even though I've tried to meet with countless uh, uh, legislators to try to change that, but that is still on the books. Well, that, I think that's a, 
just uh, thinking about that, you're able to destroy the American flag, but that you're not able to do that to the Confederate flag. Right. Is. Now, no, no prosecutor would try to push that in court of law, I don't think. But the fact that it's still, on the, still books, there on the books, and, yes. the, and the fact there's been no political will to erase that from the books, mm -hmm. while they're erasing voting lines and redlining and doing this stuff, they need to apply that to some of these crazy laws and statutes and some of these Southern and other Let's uh, go next, to next, some... next, next slide, please. Now this getting to the burning. So 2015, as we move from 2004, I, um, after what happened in Baltimore, remember that? Uh, yes. Yeah. I uh, said, you know, now it's time. It's heating up. 2015 is also the 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. So let's do something special and to do something that I couldn't do in Gettysburg. So I organized a 13 state Confederate flag funeral all at the same time on Memorial Day and set up 13 teams. And this was before Zoom. So we had- Wait, to let's, this is like, so you had planned like a happening simultaneously in 13 states. All the 13 stars that are in the Confederate flag, each one, connects to a state. And so those are the states that I use. To, that there is going to be a burial. Yeah, it's going to be a and, burial. And uh, how did you go about and do it? I mean, that's a very So I reached out, uh, yeah, I reached out to poets, musicians, community organizers, and set up teams, put people together in these mm -hmm. places to create this happening that we would film all at the same time and stream through my website. And so that happened on Memorial Day. And then- I think it should be every year. Yeah, yeah, so that's what I've been doing every year since then. Next, next slide. So I ended up going to Columbia. Uh, I don't know if I tried. Now here's the thing. After I did the 13 flag funerals, um, three weeks later, you had the AME church murders. Oh. This is three so weeks later. And then after that happened, because of Dylan's roof, the shooters or the murderers' um, connection to the Confederate flag on his Facebook and so thing, so it's this incredible urge to get rid of the flag in mm -hmm. South Carolina. Plus, it happened in South Carolina, mm -hmm. which you know, which is kind of incredible to think that it took nine people to get killed to address this Confederate flag issue in South Carolina. It's it just unbelievable to me. Just horrific. So um, I went to, uh, on the 4th, for the 4th of July, I went down to South Carolina where I launched a 50 state burning of the Confederate flag. So what I did uh, for Memorial Day, I escalated that and set up teams in all 50 states. And this is, and then I went to South Carolina where I set up this uh, burning of, and I did a whole like mm -hmm. burn and bury uh, 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 kit thing. This is Detroit, the following couple years later. So I've been doing them every year on Memorial Day, this idea of burning Confederate flags. Uh, next slide, please. And then in 2000, I think it's 18, no, 17, I got the opportunity to hang the flag publicly like I wanted to do in Gettysburg. Oh. So uh, Ohio University, uh, um, I did, there is the slide, and this is what it looks like. Next slide, please. 13 years later. You know, I that wanted to do this so in Gettysburg, so I ended up doing this in Ohio uh, that many years later. Next slide. So, fast forwarding now to what, what I've been working on now. Um, this past season, I've, you know, I had a show in uh, Columbia, uh, Tampa, and uh, Virginia, Virginia Museum of Fine, Fine Art with uh, Valerie Cassell Oliver's Dirty South show. And I did a burn and bury this past year at the um, Houston Museum of African American Culture. So this was kind of like a little mini tour thing I called Down South Dixie. Um, and, and in some ways, the show in Columbia was kind of a mini retrospective of the flag work. Let's, let's see. 
so you can see some of those images. And this is where you were an artist in residence yes, too. And, yeah, and absolutely. Come and absolutely. Talk to so the this police. is the show. Right. So this is the show in Columbia was kind of like a, a retrospective. And this is in now. Uh, this is uh, 2021, right? This is, this 2020. is this summer. Just yeah, so this is this summer. Yeah. Here. And so uh, 2021, and then we'll move it to 2020 in a minute. Okay. And so um, that's the world's largest Afro Confederate flag. Next slide, please. And you see, this is the image I did in 2004, right? Like me between this Confederate, mm -hmm. it's called the, you know, you know, the American Gothic. So I call this the Confederate Gothic. <laughs> and then here are the, oh. the, the images of, of, of the gallows of me hanging all five Confederate flags, all major ones. Next, uh, that's a good shot there, next. And then we see the urns. Mm -hmm. Right, we have the black urns representing the black body, the mm -hmm. susceptible, and then out comes this resurrected uh, Afro Confederate. Seems like flag. it should be so, up, you know, we, all the time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this is uh, the fallen cross with the Confederate mm -hmm. uh, flags, make the cross, the black and white sequence. And now you're making it really for like the art gallery. Right Museum. now, I'm returning Museum. back yeah. next. And then these are the for Florida, these are the voting booths from the 2000 elections. Mm -hmm. And then the back of the red, white, and blue, these are Confederate mm -hmm. flag mm -hmm. textured. Those are the hanging chats with Al Gore. Oh, I, I saw this one, yeah, yeah. this was in Florida. Yeah. yeah, next. And then while I'm in this space, yes, uh, this gallery right across the hallway, I'm in uh, my, uh, you know, living space and uh, three o'clock in the morning, I'm looking out over my loft area and I look into the window and I see this light, these lights coming in. And I'm thinking, what the hell? So you were asleep I in, your, I woke up. in your place where you're living as an artist in residence right. and this space is attached to- And across the hallway oh, is the show is that the you gallery. just saw. the gallery, all right. So at this point, I'm thinking- Which is similar like here, they right. have artist residence right. space with guests. So I'm thinking, the Klan has found me here. Oh. I'm thinking the Ku Klux, you know, I'm thinking they're either, I'm thinking they're in the parking lot, you know, with the lights letting oh. you know. All right, so I roll out of bed, get my cell phone, go into the little bathroom, try to call 911. No cell, signal's very bad. I go to the next adjacent room. And at this point I start hearing sounds and I realize, wait a minute, Someone is in the space. How did they came into your space? So I'm thinking they're in the space. Long story short. Did you I, know it was the police? No. Or who did you I know? No, I thought it was the Ku Klux Klan, Confederates, Nazis. I thought I was going to be taken out to pasture, like some ritual, oh. something. That's what I'm thinking. So anyway, I come out and I put your hands up. I'm like, why? Like, what's going on? Like, and, and were they dressed as police? It was all black. I didn't see oh, anything. Didn't see, they oh walk God. up the steps and I see these white men in uniforms that didn't really fit very well. So I'm thinking, wait, y'all stole some uniforms? <laughs> I, right, I, no, I'm no, thinking like, y'all stole no, some uniforms. Really. And, and my first question is, can you please identify yourself? Yeah. And they rushed me, handcuffed me, so they so didn't I, identify themselves? Uh, yeah, after I was handcuffed. Oh. So here um, I ended up writing a police, in, an artist incident report. Uh, here you see uh, a photograph right after they left of me looking through the window. You see me taking pictures of the cop cars. In the reflection, mm -hmm. you see my silhouette. And upstairs, you see the, my bed mm -hmm. where I was staying, the sleeping space. Uh, so this is kind of like... Uh, self-portrait of uh, almost dead art. You know, they came in with their guns drawn and everything. And so I ended up, next slide please, dressing the city council and explain this is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to move into this, you know, to come into mm -hmm. someone's space, to handcuff them, not allow them to take pictures, this whole thing. And then uh, next slide, I end up organizing a, uh, a rally against the Confederate state of mind. Wow, that's... As Good a luck. response, I reached out to the uh, uh, folks, uh, the, the social justice workers there and activists and artists to create this, uh, uh, this rally. And then I was able to do something, next slide, 
was to bring oh, my flag to the steps of uh, the State House. And this, is this the this flag that you will be showing here at yes. Mama? Right behind these curtains is that flag. Oh, so that will be part of Yeah, it'll be part of the, the shows every single night. Next slide, please. And so that's me uh, giving uh, one of the talks at the rally, uh, uh, right in front of, I think that's George Washington. Next slide. Uh, that's what it looks from across the street. So to come back to that space mm -hmm. after being motivated by that same space mm -hmm. in the late 90s with my own version of the flag was very, very uh, resolving for me. And then here, the Afro Dixie remixes uh, that that's the show I uh, just did uh, with, with, with Valerie uh, at, at the Virginia Museum of Fine Art for her Dirty South show. Next slide. And there will also be here, I think, is it Wednesday that you're going to have a listening party? And also, John has sort of reclaimed Dixie right. by having uh, other musicians and artists with different genres. Next artists. slide, please. So this moves into the 2020. We're going to bring a, bring it, bring this home real quick. So the next slide is 2020. Um, the very first part of that, uh, I started writing a lot of op-eds pieces. The very first one was, should Black America be worried about the coronavirus? And that inspired me to create a video game. Uh, next slide. And also op-eds are a very important part of your practice Absolutely, too. the writing. The uh, writing and to actually the, be involved. The, the op-eds. Next slide, um, you see the did this Corona Killer uh, project. Uh, next. Then after George. Wait, let's go one thing. The, right. the, the Corona Killer, uh, this game is, you have to go to John's website to see it, but he actually creates the, a game that where you're killing the coronavirus. And right. it's just, I, I, I think it's important to see all the different mediums right. that you use and how you combine them. Right, okay? thank you, thank you. And, uh, and, you know, it is a performance piece too. And so this here is uh, after George Floyd died, which happens on the same day I was doing a uh, Burn and Bury Memorial, uh, a Memorial Day. Um, he died that same day. And so that's why I need to write this piece called Dear Police. Uh, they picked up by the uh, Orlando Sentinel. Um, and so that inspired me to do uh, a, a motion graphic piece uh, mm -hmm. next. Um, this is the blue line flag based on that with these cockpit viruses speaking to police brutality and this viral element in terms of affecting uh, uh, communities of color in terms of policing and this kind of overreactive, you know, like storm, the same kind of storm that you get uh, in terms of overexcited white blood cells mm -hmm. killing everything. <laughs> so uh, next slide. Um, and also a big part of the work that happened in 2020 was looking at the Confederate iconography and monuments and being able to push them down. In your, so in your neighborhood in, in Sarasota. In, right, in the neighborhood, there was this uh, actual marker here that was a, a marker, a tribute, uh, uh, actually a memorial, because it got the little obelisk there and benches of uh, Judah P. Benjamin, who was the Secretary of State of the Confederacy. And there was a warrant for his arrest after the Civil War, and he ended up in Sarasota, uh, where he fled to England from a port there. And he celebrated. And, yeah, so there was this right up the street from where I'm at, and it also turned out he spent time at a nearby plantation that was acquired by the uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy in the 20s, and they renamed it after Judah P. Benjamin, and it became a Confederate memorial to Judah P. Benjamin, then a state park. God. So my tax dollars yeah. go to support this former uh, slave plantation as a memorial to the former Confederate, uh, you know, um, Secretary of State of the Confederacy. So this is major problematic. So I ended up um, looking at that space and reimagining it as a slave memorial. Next, mm -hmm. next slide. And that's so here I rewrote the markers. I have a black. Um, <clears throat> and what is the name of this? Gamble Plantation. Okay. I think Gamble. it's important. Yeah, yeah. And this is outside of Sarasota. This is outside of Sarasota. So this became, so this was the work that I was doing. And in that, um, leading up to the next slide. Oh, look, you have the flag. 
Up yeah, there. you got so the it's flag a there. Imagining of it. Yeah, yeah. It's a so this is my proposal mm -hmm. to really take over that space. And I think that's so important. It has to be taken over. Yeah, like, is absolutely. Is this the one that the daughters of the Confederate? So the Florida, it's the Florida headquarters of the United Daughters of the Confederacy is on this space. But it's, it's public land. It's also yes. Oh, that is just extreme. It's unbelievable. So I started a petition. Um, I had conferences I organized on this uh, space. And so now um, we, we, we're looking at, um, you know, uh, in terms of what kind of things we do with the legal system in terms of mm -hmm. addressing this issue. Next, next. And so this brings me to this self-portrait that I did over 2020, which includes, if you look in the back, the White House with the Confederate flag on, on top, you know, when Donald Trump mm -hmm. was um, oh, yes. in office. We see uh, General Lee, uh, uh, that, that, that was a monument in Richmond mm -hmm. and with George Floyd, mm -hmm. famous. But now that monument is gone now, right? And we also obviously see the, the COVID mm -hmm. viruses and the COVID viruses. Um, we see the flag uh, pin turned upside down. Uh, this was the year we had to vote, mm -hmm. the new president. In my glasses, you'll see the planet, and then you'll see a cemetery. So this is kind of like not only a, a portrait of myself, but also a portrait of the year in terms of. And so this portrait, along with the, the, the op-ed pieces I showed, becomes the basis for this performance called 2020 Divisions of America, mm -hmm. where we're looking first at the coronavirus mm -hmm. and all the issues around that. and the medical racism, the class racism, in terms of uh, 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 dealing with that, and, and, and beyond COVID, just the health system in general, and then American policing. Health and equity. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then American policing and how that um, has its own viral element to it, it going all the way back to the slavery days and, 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 and being able to the mount. Of racism. Yeah, yeah strategies to confront American policing and make it more just and more fair and that kind of thing. And then leading to the pushback on um, not just Confederate iconography, iconography but also uh, symbols and sounds and spaces of supremacy, like supremacy that, that kind of keep oppression alive in, in the cultural ways and political institutional ways. And so uh, I've invited various folks to write letters I had a doctor write a letter to a patient, and then also a woman who wrote to one of her um, ancestors who was an uh, uh, enslaved person at the Gamble Plantation. So that's been incorporated into this um, performance, first at the Ringling uh, Museum of Art that had a residency to help develop that. And so here we're going to add some extra elements to the performance, mm -hmm. and I'm excited about showing this on I can't wait to Friday to, to Saturday or Sunday. And then um, December 1st, we're going to have a listening. The listening, I, it's a wonderful I don't know if you guys can see me. Uh, so what you, what you guys have here, we have the double album, um, liner notes by the great Greg Tate. Um, this is 13 different black versions of the song, Dixie, jazz, blues, hip hop, and on and on and on. Uh, so we're going to have a listening session. Come out and see that, and also be able to see the flag. The following day on Thursday, we'll be able to see uh, the film, film. The Recoloration Proclamation, which you saw the trailer earlier. And is there an art? Is one of the times? Is there a talk back on any of these? Yes, yeah, so I'll be available after the uh, for the first two nights to be able to oh, talk wonderful. and engage, and you'll be able to engage the work as well. Um, but yeah, basically you're gonna get a listening uh, session, a film screening, and three nights of performances. Uh, Friday, the, Saturday, yeah, and Friday, Sunday. Friday, Saturday at seven. And then the film is on Sunday as well. And at, at two o'clock, two p.m. Again. So basically this is, this is my way of wrapping this up. And I wanna thank you, Karen. You've been so supportive and inspirational and creative uh, in terms of your input. I also wanna thank Bob Holman who first gave me the opportunity to, con to use his space and show the work, um, you know, and, 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 and make introductions to uh, Mary Baraka, have him be a part of it. And it's, he's always been such at the forefront of, of, of making words matter mm -hmm. and poetry and language 
matter, you know, as, as so many things are endangered and Bob is there uh, doing his work. So I so appreciate his work. And also the Brooklyn Rail, I want to thank the Brooklyn Rail for be, giving me this opportunity and, and, and having the thoughtfulness to, to um, give space to the complexity of this work. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, being supportive and loving and our audience and, too and, and being and, and helping spread the, the energy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Oh, and also I want to thank La Mama, right? I want La to thank uh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, I want to, uh, Mia for for being such a, a great host and giving me this opportunity to share this work. And, uh, and I was thinking we had that uh, show that we were part of that I asked you to be part of. This yes, La Mama. Show yes, and this is how I came too. here because Karen had a show and I was able to show part of the um, the uh, Corona Killer game. It was, we had a lot of, we had, yeah, a, yeah. We had a wonderful So I want to thank. Uh, now, do you want to, this, John, you, you're just such a, you're just such a fantastic, important artist. You're, you know, a national treasure. And I want to thank you for your commitment and dedication to such important, profound work that you continue to do. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. And I really, it, I know it's going to be a wonderful week here and to have you back here in New York. Mm -hmm. I know that just as part of my role here, if it's all right, is that we have Bob Holman going to be giving a reading. And also, I didn't know if we have enough time for any questions or things like that. So I just wanted to check here with our larger hosts about where we're at here now. Sure, sure. No, um, I think we have time just for a couple of questions. Um, but I, I want to start also by thanking you both for this conversation today. Thank you, John, for the work that you do. And I would remind everyone there are links in the chat um, where you can check out uh, the schedule and all the performances coming up at La Mama. So please click that link and get your tickets. Um, but first, I'm going to pass the mic over to my colleague, Anya. Anya, you can turn on your mic now. Thank you, Nick. Uh, yeah, thank you for this, this wonderful conversation. It was so wonderful to get a, a review of your work, but I feel like we really got deep in some places. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really interested in um, kind of uh, the, the use of your remixed Afro-Confederate flag um, as like an anti-national symbol or an anti-Confederate symbol outside of um, a, like explicit art space um, or an art installation. Um, and, you know, towards the end, you showed images of it being thrown at Gamble Plantation. But someone asked, you know, are you still making bumper stickers in the chat? And I'm just wondering. I, uh, I have bumper stickers, they'll be available at the show. But believe it. I'm just curious about how you. But, but but also you gotta so after I did the um Harlem show, right, or maybe even after the um, um Soho show, I ended up taking the because I was so discouraged at how I felt like the work wasn't being moved or moving or, or impactful in the gallery space. So I ended up taking that flag to a clan anti-clan rally in St. Pete, St. Petersburg in Florida. And uh, and it was just so destabilizing for the Klan folks. They didn't know what to make of it. Like, what the hell is this? And so I've definitely tried to use that flag as an object of protest and real protest. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to have the flag on steps of the uh, South Carolina State House for me was very, very, very important. And to have that on the front page of the state, that's the state paper in South Carolina, you know, it was also, you know, becomes part of the story. So, so got to keep in mind, when I first started doing art, it was basically me look, doing clocks, right? And doing, you know, bases, do everyday objects. I'm all about the work um, occupying it, 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 different spaces, spaces that make functional sense, spiritual sense, conceptual sense, and can move through, whether it's an art gallery or being, you know, on the steps of, of, of a state house. Uh, so that, that, that's a very important part of the work. And also with the Square Root of Love and the wine project and having dinners and reaching out beyond the, the white cube to get people to, because at the end of the day, this is about people, right? It's about people, 
having conversations, sharing stories, sharing expression about what it means to be alive, what it meant to be alive, what it means to be human, what it will mean to be human. It's, it's that is important. Otherwise, it becomes an archaeological kind of uh, exercise. And, and I, I think keeping it alive in that way is important for my work. And for me as an artist to enjoy doing it, right? I, you know, and so having relationships with people like Karen and, and Bob and the host of other folks I've worked with, that is just such a spiritual and creative, um, incredible uh, space to live in. And, and one of the joys of living, it really is. Amazing. Yeah, I guess, and as a follow-up, like in relation to that, and with like you're giving out bumper stickers, like do you, is one of your desires that people like take these flags? I don't know, I'm thinking about how, you know, you have the American flag upside down as a pin and people will wave an upside down American flag as kind of a symbol of protest. Right. Do you envision people taking these Afro-Confederate flags in a similar fashion? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. At this point, I've done my 20 years, like, take, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I want to, other projects I'm interested in doing and moving in other chapters. And I think I put the work in on, on many different levels and develop strategies that I can carry to other um, art projects I'm interested in doing. And, uh, you know, it felt like a nice 26 mile uh, uh, point one or two, whatever it is, marathon. And now I'm ready to move into other spaces and, 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 and the conversation continues to go as we interrogate and occupy uh, plantation spaces and this and that. And, and I think that's great. And, and I wanna be able to uh, contribute to that as well. But uh, there's other works, uh, you know, math artworks and public stuff and other things I have on my mind. So, uh, but like I said, this, you know, this kind of work doesn't happen by one person. It's a collaboration. It's a, it's an interconnection, and, and I've tried to build that kind of uh, kind of lattice of, um, of activation in some ways. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anya, for that question. That question, and thank you, John, for that response. Uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to our good friend G. E. Schwartz. G. E. You can turn your mic on now. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's so invigorating in many, many ways. Um, um, I can't wait to hear the recording of the various versions. And I was thinking of years ago in uh, Math the Anonymous, the film by Bob Dylan, he recorded and performs a, a version of Dixie too, which is pretty damn chilling. Um, my question though is, can you speak to how the writing of op-eds is, is a core complement to the work, is sort of an outreach beyond the work? Well, okay, so I think the very first serious op-ed piece I wrote was the one I wrote in Gettysburg, where I had to, I felt so conflicted about what I should do. Like, should I go there? Should I not go there? Should I cancel the show? To be angry? And, and at some point, I did what, which is my art part, is taking the opposites and creating this mitigating middle thing. And so I ended up sending what I could and then boycotting. Mm -hmm. So in some ways I sent as much as I could send physically but retreating psychologically, right? And so the, the op-ed piece gave me an opportunity to explain the bigger concepts so there wouldn't be any confusion. So in that I realized how important it is to have, to linearize your ideas, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and be able to express the intent of my own like vulnerability around what I'm thinking and ask questions. And that becomes part of a record in a different kind of way than just leaving an object. And so the op-ed became a way for me to frame the work, motivate myself. And basically it becomes a contract. So if I'm saying this, I, got, I wanna measure up to this. Mm -hmm. And it's been written. And so if I'm gonna do this, then I, I was out there and I'm gonna, that pushes me. So it's also a way for me to um, keep me on course for, for the things that I think are important. And, you know, in text, and as I become more of a writer, I realize the importance of text, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of whether you're writing a love song or writing a constitution or 
writing something in law, text is so fundamental to the way we move through cultural political spaces. And, and it also helped you um, really be thoughtful about how you think about things. So uh, the writing is very, very, very important. Um, and you know whether you're writing code or doing math or writing a poem, you know, just writing in general, uh, it, it's, 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 it's very, very, has been a very important part of our process. I'd like to just con contribute here. Yeah, As absolutely. part of our yeah. friendship, yeah. we discuss a lot of what are the ways that we can be advocates or how are the ways that when the work is uh, miscommunicated, how to communicate it. Yeah. So it becomes, you, the op-ed becomes a space of advocacy. It right. becomes a space of the, for the record. Right. And instead of just the press or people speaking about it, you you you, you speak it out. And you right. and uh, so it's it's taking the work also outside of the art market and letting the art market or right. the economy right. speaking for it. And so it's putting it within this uh, within the words right. and within that. Right. the advocacy of the writing right. and you it's just very impressive of how you sustain that and continue and i right. think that that's important for artists to be doing right. more of that yeah and, and it's also much more flexible right so when kanye west made that comment about slave being slavery being a choice i was able to respond to that with the op-ed for cnn right quickly and to be able to provide an artist mindset to that statement where I thought Kanye was coming from. Or when Aretha Franklin died, then I want to write an op-ed about what that means. And that's been a year and a half and find a space to, you know, be able to show some work that I'm... So I think it, it is a certain level of immediacy and also uh, expansiveness of being able to write, particularly when you start building a network of places. And also I think it's important for the creative community to chime in mm -hmm. on important national, cultural, political issues. We want to hear from our most creative folks in terms of what they can offer in terms of solutions and insights. Otherwise, it becomes creatives talking to other creatives all the time and not really sharing those kind of insights and strategies with the wider community. So for instance, when um, the, when I did uh, the op-ed in St. Pete Times, no, the Tampa Bay Times, uh, about the Gamble Plantation, academics reached out to me. Uh, oh, politicians right. reached out to me, and I was able to reach this audience if I would have just been stuck in, in a gallery and waiting for a review to address the work. And then from that, I'm able to like uh, make more connections and relationships with, with this wider. But that's a very good question mm -hmm. about um, the importance of uh, you know the strategies around op-eds and, and, and the fact that it's very core uh, to the work. Thank you, GE, and thank you both, John and Karen, for that response. Um, as is our tradition, I'm going to pass the mic over to the Rails' own Fong H. Bui for our final question of the day. Uh, Fong, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, John, for the lovely, essential conversation. Um, and I was thinking when you undertook your own activism, very, you know, determined, very decisively so. I, I can't help but thinking about what ways in which certain artists among our community carve out a certain specific personal mediation to do so. And one of the ways that I always think about intervention as public art is that sometimes the artists create this, the activism, but then, then they're not there at all. <laughs> it's only <laughs> persona, some kind of personification through the performing that involves other. But in your case, is a certain very definitive reclaim space in a personal level, taking back what you can do. I mean, you talk about op ed and all that. I can't help but to think of how, for example, Karen have gone through her own struggle with legal means, mm -hmm. uh, certainly with your, you know, her NEA case in the late nineties, I remember very clearly. Um, and that is a certain kind of strategy that I think anticipating to legal ramification or, 
or justification or even legal fees, you know, John. So mm -hmm. I don't know how many times you have been arrested. <laughs> but the point is that how conscious were you beforehand? Is it, was it a premeditation or was it something rather, you know, spontaneously happened without your control? Yeah, I mean, you mean in terms of the possibilities of being arrested and detained and yeah, those type of Well, I always knew that that was a uh, a risk doing this work. I've always accepted that, and I remember after the get doing the Gettysburg show and getting ready for that, getting being contacted by the FBI to tell me that um, someone. I guess Homeland Security had done some monitoring in the dark web and there was some chatter about coming down to, to kill me someplace from somebody in South Carolina and that they were giving me a courtesy call to let me know. <laughs> it was like, we're here to let you know. I'm like, well, what are you gonna do? Put a car out in front or whatever? You know? No, we're not gonna do that. We just will let you know. Right? And so, um, I've always been conscious of that. And also in, 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 in South Carolina, you know, knowing that here I am going to South Carolina, Columbia, which is the thick of it and knowing how dangerous. So I, I think I've accepted those risks. And, uh, and, and, and in some ways, you know, here I am worrying about the Ku Klux Klan. I need to be worrying about the cops. That's really, uh, you know, this is much more complicated and, uh, and, you know, very often I notice, even with my work and trying to to push it, very often I've had you know more tension with some of the liberal institutions in terms of you know, hey, we're going to do this. Oh, we're not going to really do that because that's going to be a problem. You know, and so yeah, that's been a lot of the fighting in terms of what worrying about uh, pushing the work and the security of the work. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question very directly. Um, I, I, I haven't thought about it in a, in a straight up risk management team, let's get together, throw the dice. It's been more like, this is important work. And um, I understand the risk. I will be as safe as possible, but I understand the risk. In the context when nine people get shot, mm. you know, they contribute to a movement without even knowing it, right? Yeah. And then George Floyd, right? So the risk of just dying and getting hurt and arrested just because is great, let alone when you add, you know, intention and activism and trying to make the world a better place. Yeah. So um, when, when I put that in, in, in context to the people who really lost a lot and lost their lives and lost their, you know, I, I think my contribution and the risk I take is is in honor of these greater risks that have gone before me. Yeah, oh, well, that's, that's terrific. Thank you, thank you, John. I'm just thinking about how sometimes artists have incredible uh, creative entitlement to mobilize our own freedom of expression very specifically. Mm -hmm. But at times, you know, we are the, the susceptible to social change, political change around us thinking about how I used to be so reticent to become more technologically more sufficient <laughs> until recent realizing how Trump is quite brilliant in deploying speed through technology. Right. That's how we came about to create this platform here through Zoom to bring warm and community together right. and to amplify the slowness of culture as an arsenal against speed. Right. I'm thinking about this because whatever happened to us, we have to um, be agile, you know, and subject to undertake changes and adaptation to do all the, the thing that we need to do. Just thinking about, for example, uh, the Futurist Manifesto that was written in 1912 um, when Filippo Manaretti, and then when he met together in the war, the first war with Mussolini, uh, we know the Mussolini took the idea from futurist art. Speed, technology, and violence is exactly they became best friend forever. So the, the, we have to reclaim some of the idea as artists, and I'm glad that you're doing that. Thank so, you. Thank you, John.
Thank Can't you. wait to go to see see the show at La Mama. Yeah. Oh yes, grazie mille. Thank you, Karen, also for being so great as you are. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you, Fon. Thank you both. Um, well, yes, I want to mention once more, we'll put it in the chat, but a link to La Mama where you can get tickets and find all the information for each performance. Um, but here at The Whale, we have a tradition of ending our events with a poetry reading. So I am thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Bob Holman, to the stage. Um, an American poet and poetry activist, Bob Holman has spent the last four decades working variously as an author, editor, publisher, performer, MC of live events, director of theatrical productions, a producer of films and tele television programs, among many other things. Uh, Holman is the founder and proprietor of the, the Bowery Poetry Club and was described by Henry Louis Gage Jr. in the New Yorker as the postmodern promoter who has done more to bring poetry to cafes and bars than anyone since Ferlinghetti. Um, and with that big statement, I will hand it over to you, Bob. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nick and Fong. And, you know, I'm just uh, enraptured with today's down to earth discussion and a, a, a trip down memory lane known as the uh, the arts works of John Sims, who to me represents the kind of uh, openness and ever possible that can incorporate uh, lunches with uh, opposites and uh, pull all of us up ahead. And Karen is the perfect interlocutor for this. You know, like these two people are way out on the extremes, you know, and yet when they sit down here at the rail and talk to each other, it's the kind of conversation that everybody in this audience is participating in. That is the gift. And uh, it's what art is all about. And that's why I'm uh, honored to join these heroes of mine with, uh, with the uh, benediction here. I'm gonna do a poem about the COVID, which uh, I've had it with, and I'm slipping under the COVID curtain as much as possible. I've discovered if you get out there under it, uh, you know, wearing your masks, of course, and getting all the shots, um, that people are, are so hungry to have uh, to have action uh, in their in their neighborhoods, um, and after I do this poem, there will be a, a a video poem, one of my favorites here in the in the third consciousness, digital consciousness, after orality and literacy, um, about that, about a neighborhood, my neighborhood, the Bowery, and how it reacted when the uh, when the ply went up to to secure the 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 uh, the uh, the storefronts from the, the terrible uh, events after George Floyd, which were wonderful events, and too bad that the criminal elements came in and busted them down. But that's another story. So here comes the the uh, the oral uh, rendition of the uh, the text poem, and uh, then will come the the the, the video. It was the worst of times, and then it got worse. My memoir was stuck, except I hadn't started to write it yet. Both Bob Dylan and Allen Ginsberg showed up in the same dream. Great. Bob was young, happy about his perf at the gig I'd lined up for him. Bob, he said to me, will you carry my other guitar to the party and honor I thought, grabbing the neck and going back inside to check if he meant yet another guitar, only to discover that everybody's laptops had been ripped off. Mine? I started looking and ended up at the party anyway. 
One room was a concert in a high school auditorium. Older Alan was beaming in a white shirt and tie, took his seat, front row, folding chair. So much going on as I made my way to the roof, only I never got there either. Looking down on everything, a giant carnival ride with room for all. Anything that shows up is temporary. As I was saying, poetry, in an offhand, the shock of the plague, amidst the spiritual awakening, political revelation, irrelevancy of everything. It was the worst of times, Charles. And then it got worse. So here are some pandemic shorties from March 2020. Ask not for whom the siren wails. That's you in there. March 2021, why get out of bed? You just have to get back in again. November 2021, it happens every hundred years. Get used to it. Okay, so that's my little news of the day for uh, John and Karen and everybody else. And now if uh, go, things go well with technology, which believe it or not at the rail happens more often than not, here it comes. This is what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Murals on the Bowery? Bring back Bowery Project. Bleaker than bleaker, barer than nada y nadia, a plywood desert out my window on the Bowery, a siren of silence, blind leading the blinder, looters, cops, brooder brutes, systemic collapse, and a sick rose, slashed tire, tiredness, buffeted by pandemic waves. Racism pulls nerves from our bodies using iron stupidity clips. Fascism, a laying hot macadam on our wounds. The leadership, ha, is tyranny. And then the artist got a hold of it. Sprung rhythm, art garden splash, walls blossom, black lives matter. Many's the days and many's the ways and many's the time come before. As the dead and the dying and the violent lying wait covidly, patiently next door. The Bowery resurrects. Now there's a next. See, there's a lot more to go than before. And the art that you see lifts infinity as you stop dead in your footsteps and roar. Up the ladder with the brush and rush. Yes, there's hardly a clown in the sky. Scooters punched them in their plywood nose. So stop your gab and chatter. Spell out Black Lives Matter. The flowers beckon. A good luck spot, I reckon. Emmett Till is still here. Dressed in colorful crack. A blessing for the homeless. Bowery Mission sidewalk is tattooed with poem shadow. No one shall utter the debt owed to wonder. All together now, call out the name. That's not anonymity's face on the wall of grace. George Floyd is breathing again. More art than's ever been seen before. It's a gift. It's capitalism's grave. There's no one to recall bounce back from the fall into summer heat saving grace. There is no justice in America, but it is the fight for justice 
that sustains you. Baraka says that cross from his pad on Cooper Square. Hetty still lives there, and the murals that give sustain us on the streets where we live. Individual power dies twice every hour to be born down in utopic Foley Square. I saw you on your bike with your mask and your strike and the placards that gleamed in the pools of your dream. Oh, artists, indefatigable rascals of love. The looters and shooters and dumbass computers lie down in the middle of the streets. But BLM keeps on marching. It's the Bowery's fortune, and the past is the future again. Don't tell us what to do with the nail and the screw, with the paint and the roller, bucket and rags in a stroller. Dance on the graves of the rich and enslave those who'd profit from sweat that's not theirs. Lift your horn, lift your voice. It's for you. Make the choice. It's the people's history. Free art on the Bowery, the Garden of Power. Contemplation's bower down on the Bowery, where art knows how to live. Thank you so much, Bob, uh, for sharing your poetry and that beautiful video with us today. That was a perfect way to conclude this event. So thank you. Uh, once again, thank you, John and Karen, and a very special thank you to Mia Yu at La and everyone at La Mama for helping to make today's conversation possible. Uh, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. Join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation between Catherine Murphy and Ksenia M. Sobaleva on the occasion of Catherine Murphy's recent work on view at Peter Freeman Gallery. We'll conclude with a poetry reading from uh, our favorite Lynn Crawford. So uh, thank you everyone for joining and you can now all turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Thank, you much. John. Thank, thank you, John. Thank you. Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thank Amazing. Thank you. And thank you, Bob. Amazing. Yeah. Great poem, Bob. Hey. Beautiful. Great conversation, Bob. Karen and John. Beautiful poem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. What a reading. Woo wee. What a reading. Yeah. Yeah, music it was amazing. It worked all together so beautifully. Thank you, John. Thank you. Go see the show, okay? La Mama. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you there, Johnny. Take care. Bye. Take care, everyone.